Hi, welcome to Washington Policy on the Go, another edition of uh, our weekly series, or I should say every other week uh, series during the legislative session, because uh, every other week we feature a legislative lunchbox. The difference is in Washington Policy on the Go, we feature center directors uh, about their research and their observations and analysis, whereas in Legislative Lunchbox, we offer interactions with lawmakers uh, in Olympia concerning what's happening in the legislative session. Coming up today, we've got three center directors joining us to give updates on key legislation and actions uh, in Olympia. Uh, we'll be joined uh, in a moment by Pam Lewison. She is our um, director for our initiative on agriculture. Um, we'll talk with her about what's happening with the so-called buffer bill, a bill that um, is a challenge, I think, to property rights for farmers and, and rural residents uh, that would allow the state to essentially control uh, large buffers along stream beds and, uh, and rivers and other areas. We'll talk with her about that. Uh, then we'll get an update from Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director, concerning a bill that um, would allow employees, um, and even not necessarily employees, others, uh, to sue employers if they thought there was a violation of, of labor law. So we'll talk with, uh, with Mark Harmsworth about the progress um, of that bill in Olympia, where it stands, and what the concerns of employers are, and whether there's been changes since our last time around. And then we'll speak with Maria Frost, our, our Coal Center for Transportation Director, concerning the mileage tax, the RUC tax, and, uh, and a new poll that WPC um, had commissioned. Um, and we'll show some of the results of that poll, what uh, Washington, Washington voters, how Washington voters feel about the mileage tax um, and congestion relief and where they prioritize um, transportation policy. So we'll break some news um, on our poll results here uh, a bit later on in the program. But let's start with, uh, with Pam Lewison, our Initiative on Agriculture Director, um, who is actually at a convention right now. Um, Pam, uh, thanks so much for making, making the time, especially I know, I know that you're very busy. Um, the buffer bill, I, I even hate calling it the buffer bill because I feel it, it sounds too friendly. Um, first, let's give a synopsis so uh, new folks know what it is that we're talking about, and then let's talk about where it stands now. So the buffer bill, or I mean, if you want to come up with a less friendly name, you could call it the anti-ag bill. Uh, what it really does is um, establish uh, an extension of our existing buffers along streams, rivers, floodplains. Um, primarily in rural and ag communities. And it extends them from their current range of 50 to 100 feet. And it uh, expands them pretty significantly from 100 feet to potentially 250 feet. I think the bill actually says 249 uh, a foot, you know, call it what you want. Yeah. Um, and uh, it would force landowners to self-fund um, the installation of trees at a specific height to um, provide habitat for salmon along those areas. Um, the, the problem with this is that you have to abandon that land, even if it's productive farmland, um, for a fraction of, of the cost of what that land is worth at market value. Um, this is not a voluntary program, this is a mandate. Um, currently, the bill appears to have stalled, uh, but anyone who's worked in policy for longer than a few minutes knows that no bill is truly dead until uh, session is adjourned. So, in th this bill, I take it there's no tax relief for people who, you know, once this property is essentially taken over in all but name um, for the purposes of public benefit, the individual would still be stuck paying full property taxes on it, right? I mean. Yes, so you are you are entitled to some relief on the front end. You can submit your receipts for 70 to 90% reimbursement of the cost of uh, purchasing the trees and having them installed. However, then you're on the hook to pay property taxes and you have to maintain those trees uh, in perpetuity. And the, the trees, 
how, what are we talking about here? There, so you can't plant seedlings. You have to plant, a, you know, a tree that that's already providing shade or something along well, these zones. So there's no there's no real specific language about what sort of trees you're planting. So it's maybe seedlings. It may not be, but they are site specific trees. So um, it's up to an ecology surveyor to come out and tell you what variety of tree you have to plant and how many. Um, I keep having that Barbara Walters uh, Saturday Night Live skit. If you know, if you were a twee, what kind of twee would you be? <laughs> I'm going through my head here. Um, what? So, has this passed either house, or is it just stuck in the committee of the House of Origin? Right now, it's in the Chamber committee. Of uh, it's in the committee of origin, which is in the House. Um, there is both. There is a companion bill in the Senate, but it was not heard. Um, the hope is that it remains in, uh, in the House Committee. The real, the real crux of this bill is actually in what you would be compensated in the event that you are um, identified as one of these people who has to put in a buffer. Um, you're, you essentially would be reimbursed $1,000 an acre um, for any land that gets taken out of um, production beyond half an acre. Uh, in Washington state, the average cost for farmland is $13,000. Um, that's an average from 2019. So uh, we're talking about something that's less than 10% of the actual value of your land. And uh, once you are reimbursed that dollar amount, you can never ever farm that land again. So the compensation issue is really a joke. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, we wanna be able to say we're offering compensation but we're not actually compensating anybody for anything. It's certainly not a fair market rate. We just want to we want to be able to seize this for public benefit without actually paying the, the full cost. This is a problem. I, I had a friend who was building on uh, some property. Uh, I think it was Skagit County, but you know there was a a, a ditch that was uh, there. It was you know it was obviously kind of meant to just move some water off the hayfield, and they called it a stream. And they were create they were saying he was going to have to have this buffer. Um, and I had another um, uh, friend who was building and he, they had not given permission for, for people to inspect, you know, the whole property, but they said, yeah, you can inspect the building site. And then they just went to the back 40 and suddenly declared areas wetland. And they found themselves with lots of their property that they can't do anything with, even though, you know, they, they'd owned it for years and years and years and years and weren't planning on doing anything, but suddenly, you know, they've got new rules and regs attached to their property. This is a problem for property owners and and a number of different uh, for a number of different reasons and um, and then Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment um, director, also pointed out that the supposed benefit to salmon isn't there either because the the buffers that exist for streams there's you know there's a um, what is it the the farther out you're going for this buffer the less return you're actually getting for the fish you want to you want to summarize that. So there's, there's a couple of issues on the, on the habitat side of things. One, fish need shade, but they also need sunlight too. So um, that's one issue when you're looking at in-stream uh, habitat restoration, but also uh, Todd's right, you know, the further out you get, um, the more that shade doesn't necessarily extend into the waterway. You know, it has the potential to extend into um, those product, productive farmland areas. And so what you have instead is more crop loss than just what is planned in the buffer zone. And, um, you know, the other thing to think about too is when you look at some of these buffer zones, um, you know, about six weeks ago, most of Whatcom and Skagit County were underwater and everything that was underwater in those two counties would be subject to this piece of legislation. So we're talking about entire farms that are wiped off the map because they are, because they are all in the floodplain. I'm sorry to laugh. I'm not laughing at the, the plight. It's very horrible, but I, I, I picture it like an old Twilight Zone episode where the devil gives you a contract and there's so much fine print in there that no matter what you do with it, you end up um, in a bad place at the, at the end of it. Pam, thanks so much for the update there. Um, we'll have you come back around for the Q&A in case uh, folks have, have questions. And I know you've got a conference uh, to pay attention to too. So I'll let you turn your video off. Now we'll turn our attention now to Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director. 
who's got some uh, dandy legislation update us on as well. Last time we talked, Mark, I think um, I think we brought this up. This is a, a, a bill that um, it has a fancy name for it that nobody understands, but in, in essence, it's, it's the um, how can I sue my employer and make a living doing it, uh, Bill, this, this is the way I like to summarize it. Um, first of all, tell, tell us about you know, what the bill does and where it's at right now. Yeah, so the, the bill is House Bill 1076. Uh, the technical term is KETAM, but we like to refer to it as the Bounty Hunter Bill, or if you really want to go further, you can call it the Bandit Bill. Um, and what this uh, allows you to do, uh, and initially, it, when you think about it, you think of it from an employee perspective. But as you correctly pointed out earlier, Dave, uh, anyone can actually do this. And it enables you to bring a lawsuit on behalf of the attorney general's office against an employer for a perceived or a real workplace violation. And um, as most employers know, the agency that oversees our workplace safety is uh, Labor and Industries or LNI. And there is already rules on the books and law on the books that make sure that an employer cannot create an unsafe environment. And if they do, they get fined and things have to be cleaned up. So what this enables you to do is you could be sitting there and in your office and Johnny and Sally are having a, a conversation that you think that Sally was offended by, even if she wasn't. And now you can bring a complaint or a lawsuit against your employer for that. Um, and the, uh, the, the settlement, which is ultimately where this is going to end up, because most employers are going to look at the financial side of things and say, OK, it's not worth our while going to court to defend our innocence here. We're just going to pay the settlement. 40 percent of the settlement goes to the person that brings the, uh, the bounty claim against the employer, <laughs> if you like. And it doesn't, like I mentioned, it doesn't have to be an employee. It could be somebody just walking by and they look through the window and they say, you know what? I don't like what's going on inside this building. I think there's a workplace violation and they can bring a lawsuit. The 60% incidentally is split between the trial lawyers who really, really love this bill and uh, the agency uh, that's affected uh, by the complaint. Well, if you're wrong, let's say, you know, you're, you're, you know, the, the drive by lawsuit guy and you see an employer, uh, you see employees doing something or an employer doing something, you think, well, maybe they're breaking the law. Um, and you start this process. Is there a, is there any penalty for creating a situation where the employer has to engage with lawyers, you know, to defend themselves? Like, you know, in other words, if they really haven't broken the law, does it come back and, you know, and, and force the accusing party to pay for the legal fees or anything of the kind? No, because you're using the attorney general and you bring a, a suit on behalf of the state. So there's almost no penalty other than the time it takes and potentially the infamy that it brings. So you can also imagine it can be it being used as a punitive measure from one of your competitors as a company. Um, or it could be a, uh, a union that maybe wants to get in and, and, and cause some trouble. Uh, so it really is an absolutely horrible bill. Uh, 1076, the Keytown bill and, and the bounty hunting bill, it just uh, it, it just flies in the face of sensibility uh, where you as the individual aren't even hurt by um, what's going on. So let me understand this. If, but if, let's say I'm an employer and somebody's accused me of something under this bill, if, if it were to pass, um, I, I assume that I would, as an employer, I'd be hiring some lawyers to defend me. And then, so, so nobody would end up having to pay my legal fees if I was falsely accused. I'd just end up out thousands of dollars because a lawyer is always thousands of dollars. I'd be out every time I was accused, whether I was guilty or not. Right. Yeah, uh, okay. that's exactly right. And that's how you, you could be a you can file all these lawsuits with no intention of ever trying to win them just to be a nuisance to a competitor right. or something like that to cause mm -hmm. just heartache for these small business owners that are trying everything they can to survive the government mandated lockdowns and pay the bills. And then, as you point out, if somebody does want to be a nuisance or an organization wants to be a nuisance, there's no penalty for being a nuisance. So you know, there's you know no skin off their nose to cause big problems or financial ruin for the person that they're accusing, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I mean, you look at what's happened in Seattle over the course. You know, there's there's always been animosity between organized labor and and some employers, uh, but there's also a lot of groups that just seem intent on making life very tough for businesses 
And I can imagine them utilizing that as a new kind of tool um, in addition to their, their broken window <laughs> theory of economic engagement that they that currently employ in, in Seattle right yeah, and now. The, so. And the biggest offender of trying to destroy a small business is the state of Washington. So, you know, with all this legislation, they keep pushing down through the legislature. And a lot of it is sponsored by these government agencies um, and requested legislation. You know, they, it's very hard to be a small business owner just now. Was this requested legislation? Um, I don't believe it was. This okay. uh, the prime sponsor on this was uh, Representative Hansen. Interesting. So, um, where does this stand right now? I mean, uh, forgive me here, but how much progress has this bill made, or is it kind of languishing, you know, in isolation? Right. So what's a little bit scary is this bill was introduced January fifth last year, and for those of you who don't know, in a a legislative session is actually a two-year session split between two, um, one hundred and five and a sixty-day session. We're in the second part of it, so the bill stays alive. Last year, it made it all the way through out of the House. It was voted out down party lines through the Senate into the final committee before it went to the Rules Committee, which is the final hurdle before it gets to a final vote, and it ran out of steam. So. Uh, around, I'm looking at the list here, about April 25th, it ran out. And what happens then, it gets referred back to the House of Origin, in this case, the House of Representatives from the Senate. So right now, it's sitting in the Rules House, waiting for a, in the House of, the Rules Committee in the House, waiting for a vote to go back to the floor, and they'll vote it to the Senate. So they have to go through hearings again, but um, it's made it all the way through one House. And I don't see, there's no difference in the makeup of the House now, so I don't see if it starts to move again, they'll vote it through. That, that is just, it's frightening to me. And has it been essentially changed at all? Or is it just kind of as, as written as, it, I, mean, I should say, has it been amended? Uh, yeah, there were uh, several amendments. Um, most of them were withdrawn or uh, given scope and object, which is the technicality. If the majority party doesn't like an amendment, they scope and object it to get rid of it. So uh, probably around 30 or so, 35 amendments for the House, and because he didn't get to the Senate floor for the amendment list, uh, but I suspect there will be a similar amount of changes there if it was to move. I mean, the small business community, NFIB and AWB, um, very much opposed to this bill because of the amount of damage it can cause small businesses. I want to remind everyone, if you have questions at any point in this broadcast, feel free to put your question in the Q&A tool in Zoom. It's probably at the bottom of your screen or on the side of your screen. It's the one with the two little conversational icons. Now that we're in you know, year three of, of COVID, most people have been Zoomed to death and you probably already know it. But uh, for those, there are, there are some who don't know. So just bringing it up every time. Um, it's the, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Put your questions there so that we can get to them and we will get to them at the end, uh, toward the end of this uh, uh, broadcast. We try to answer all the questions that are asked. Uh, before I let you go, Mark, is there anything else small business related that has caught your eye or caught your attention um, or anything as a former legislator that's, uh, that's caught your attention this legislative session that you feel you should mention now? Um, yeah, there's, there's an effort and there are multiple bills uh, that sort of fall into this bucket. Um, to regulate the rental market in an effort um, by the folks that are introducing the legislation to create affordable housing. But 95% of the bills that have been introduced will have exactly the opposite effect. Um, I'm gonna be putting some material out describing uh, many of these bills this week, um, but they're, they're adding additional requirements on tenants. One of the most ridiculous ones is a six month notice from a landlord to a tenant if their rent is going up by 3% or more. And then the tenant has the ability to walk away from the lease with no penalty, which the author I suspect thinks that that's gonna keep the prices down. What it in fact will create is auto escalation in lease agreements and 12 month leases that automatically get terminated to get around it. So, you know, when they're limiting you to a 3% raise in a 7% inflation market, there's no incentive. So a lot of these bills have exactly the opposite. So I'm watching a lot of that. Um, and uh, there's, there's some other things, uh, particularly around TNCs, which are Uber and Lyft. They're trying to unionize those workers, which really kind of screws up the whole gig economy thing, being able to work when you want. So uh, they're doing a few things there. Interesting. And, and does, has Uber and Lyft, do they have a stand on that or, or 
uh, they would, I suspect they would be opposed to that. I was just wondering if they've, if they've made that. Some, sometimes businesses kind of, uh, you know, they, they go along to get along to try to alleviate some of the pain. Seems like it's eventually it gets you, you know, it's like you, know, you can feed the crocodile, but eventually when you run, when you run out of beef, the crocodile is going to come after you. Yeah. So they, uh, they've, uh, they've opposed previous versions and they've actually visited with me when I was in Olympia to say, Hey, we don't like these kind of bills. It, it not only inhibits us and the ability for us to provide great service, it reduces the amount of hours that are available for the drivers and make it, makes it less attractive. And that's the whole point of these things. Yeah. Is you can drive when you need to. Yeah. I've, I've got a friend who just had some unexpected bills come up and he signed up to be one of, one of these drivers and, you know, when his kids were in bed, he was out driving around and you know, in two months he was uh, debt free again. So, you know, it's a great gig for, for people who need it. Um, yeah, so, it is. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it, Mark. We'll have you back on during the Q&A section. Now let's turn to Maria Frost, our Coal Center for Transportation Director. Uh, Maria, um, as always, great to talk with you. Um, let's start with the transportation poll results. We, the Washington Policy Center conducted a, a poll um, in December. And we've got the results of that poll now, and we're sharing them. We released our transportation uh, poll results today, and this is the first time we've talked about it here. Um, and let's start with the, um, the miles traveled to tax question. This was a question we asked regarding public support for um, the RUC tax, um, or the, that's the road use charge, or the miles, uh, paper mile tax. The question was phrased like this, would you support or oppose replacing the state gas tax with a pay per mile tax where drivers are taxed on miles driven? And do you feel strongly about it? The total support, those who strongly support and support this tax was 31%. The total opposition, those who oppose and those who strongly oppose it was 61%. Um, you know, how did that, uh, how did th that response of 500 Washington voters, a representative sample with a margin of error of plus or minus 4%. How did that um, response uh, fit with your perceptions, Maria? Were you surprised? And how do you think it um, reflects on state policy? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, it, it didn't surprise me at all. I, you know, I've heard quite a lot of concerns expressed about um, this new policy proposal. There's a lot of questions that have yet to be answered regarding privacy issues, the administrative cost of implementing a road usage charge, you know, just to have our toll system in place on 405, the administrative costs on that are about 35%. So that's 35% that, you know, goes <laughs> to pay for admin that doesn't go back into the, you know, infrastructure. And you know, gas tax right now is really simple and easy to collect. It's also, you know, fairly simple to adjust by the legislature should the need arise to fund additional projects. Whereas implementing a road usage charge really requires, you know, putting in a, a, a pretty significant new bureaucracy in place. That's not to say that a road usage charge is not a, a good idea in theory, you know, just paying per mile, regardless of the type of method of propulsion that your vehicle uses. There's definitely um, a need to have that conversation as technology advances. Um, but again, going back to a lot of unanswered questions, I think one of the things that hasn't really helped um, move popular opinion on this issue is the efforts over the last few years to implement a road usage charge. The bills have been very flawed very suspect and problematic and you know <laughs> there is a bill this year as well it's actually got a hearing tomorrow at 1 30 p.m in the house transportation committee um house bill 2026 sponsored by representative wicks would you like me to talk about that sure so this is a i think this is the third attempt at implementing a road usage charge since um, you know, since the completion of the pilot, the pilot project in Washington state took place in 2018 and we participated in that pilot. I installed a GPS transponder in my car. I tried the odometer reading. I participated in the surveys and I was able it, to report on the policy through firsthand experience. Yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. For those of you of interest, uh, we, we videoed Maria doing these things. So <laughs> That's right, you did. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and and we we reported on some of the unsettling results of, of that pilot. Um, but the bill being heard tomorrow uh, is would implement a road usage charge of 2.5 cents per mile. Just a quick note that the tested rate was 2.4 cents per mile, which is revenue neutral to our state gas tax, um, assuming an average uh, 20.5 mile per gallon, assuming a 20.5 mile per gallon average um, for the state of Washington. And so this one implements a 2.5 cent per mile charge starting with mandatory participation from owners of electric vehicles. And then over the next couple of years, expanding the program on a voluntary basis, temporarily in my opinion, um, to those who own hybrids and all other you know, combustion vehicles. And so there are two big problems with this bill. The first is the bill caps the fee or, or the road usage charge that owners of electric vehicles would pay of $225. If you own an EV, you currently, you know, you don't pay gas tax. So you pay um, $225 on your annual vehicle registration renewals. And so this bill actually caps the road usage charge at that amount, meaning if you drive 10,000 miles, 100,000 miles a year, you're not gonna pay more. You're gonna pay 225 tops. So that really disconnects um, you know, the road usage, it, it disconnects the drivers from road use and in effect um, gives owners of electric vehicles a, a, you know, a preferential tax break that more than likely they don't need. We have data that shows that owners of EVs tend to be wealthier folks. The bill that, or the, the people that this bill hits the hardest are those with um, vehicles that get over 20 miles per gallon. Um, and that, you know, that could even, that, that's not a lot. I mean, there's trucks that get, you know, like 25 miles per gallon on highways. So the other issue with the bill, of course, um, and this is relevant to our poll, Dave, is this bill creates an account um, and sends the money that you pay in road usage charge to that account and then allows the money to be used on transportation purposes. Transportation purposes is not the same as highway purposes. Transportation purposes means that the money can be spent on roads and bridges, but it can also be spent on transit, rail, and other non-highway programs. Of course. Which makes it very, very different from a gas tax. The gas tax that you pay is protected constitutionally under the 18th Amendment, only can be spent on highways. So if lawmakers are pitching that we need a gas tax replacement, they need to make sure that they replicate the features of a gas tax. And number one among those features is making sure the money is spent on roads. Otherwise, what is what you know what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and just as a quick last point, the State Transportation Commission themselves has recommended to the legislature that there be 18th Amendment protection of a road usage charge. So the money can't be diverted um, for other things. And so this bill runs counter to that recommendation. Um, now, didn't, so didn't you recently blog about money that was um, supposed to be highway protected, but was spent millions of dollars, state dollars spent on, um, on things that, that really don't belong in that highway protected category, you know, like pedestrian kind of, of, of paths and bike trails and whatnot? Yeah. And so the, these are, you know, these are, Isolated incidents rather than a policy, right? Is that what you're... The legislature had asked um, the Department of Transportation to calculate benefits um, toward transit, bike, and pedestrian infrastructure um, spent with 18th Amendment protected dollars. So when you build a road, obviously, there are going to be benefits that transit will benefit from that road infrastructure just as cars do. Um, but what I found most concerning were the benefits for um, you know, bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Not that those things aren't important or shouldn't be provided for, but we can't expect you know, <laughs> 6 million um, drivers in our state to pay for all of those things. And so that was the reason that I highlighted that. It wasn't like a, a direct expenditure. It was a calculated benefit for those things. Yeah. Now, one of the things that our poll pointed out was that it, when people were asked a follow-up question about the road, uh, the road use charge or the miles uh, traveled tax, and that was whether you'd support or oppose, um, it, you would be more likely to support um, the uh, miles traveled tax if that money was protected by, um, by as highway funds. 
And the total was uh, 21% much more likely, 31% somewhat more likely, and then less likely total was 40%. And um, those numbers kind of surprised me. I mean, I knew people might be more likely to support, that doesn't mean they're gonna support the whole tax, but more likely is a different you know, category. What surprised me was that there was so much split. Some people, you know, saying even less likely, you know, I, I think some people are just doubling down, sending a message. That's that's how I interpret it. It's just like, you know, hell to the no, um, H-E double hockey stick. I'm, I'm not having it. Uh, I was curious what your take on, on that follow-up question was. You know, I think what we have been sold over the last few years is that lawmakers are looking for a gas tax replacement which is hard to believe in and of itself because we know that the gas tax is bonded and isn't going anywhere for many years. And so even if a road usage charge passes, people would pay a gas tax and then they would have to trust that the government provide a credit to them for the gas tax that they paid before they're charged a road usage charge. So there's a lot of mistrust and concern already about double taxation. You know, if we have, you know, in the event of some sort of financial crisis, you know, would the legislature, um, you know, waive or postpone or, or eliminate that credit. There's just a multiple, there, there are multiple questions that arise. And so I think if, if, if lawmakers are genuinely looking for a gas tax replacement, they shouldn't run bills like House Bill 2026, which is not consistent with the stated purpose that we have been told of a road usage charge, which is to make sure that everyone pays their fair share, and yet it cuts a huge deal to electric vehicle owners. Um, and so the bill seems to really try to satisfy multiple constituencies, multiple political constituencies, rather than standing on principle. And so that's, you know, it's, it's these types of proposals that raise red flags. And frankly, the 18th Amendment issue, if you're telling me you're trying to replace the gas tax, but you you know, want a road usage charge that funds anything and everything, essentially a slush fund, it's no surprise to me that that would be a non-starter. What about the um, the question about, I mean, I know this is, it's, it's more of a hypothetical, but there has been talk of a state tax that would supplement local transit taxes. And um, you and I have talked about that in the past. We asked this question in the, in the poll, you know, whether or not people would support the idea of, of a new state tax that would help um, uh, add to the funding for, for local transit. And the answer was a, a fairly resounding no, with uh, about 40% supporting the idea of the tax and 53% saying no to that tax. Um, and I value your insights on, on that and why that tax is, it's kind of a ridiculous request you know, just just at the just when one takes a glance at uh, at funding for for transit right now. Yeah, I'm glad you you brought that up. Um, it's ridiculous on two fronts. One, if you remember Initiative 976 and other previous initiatives, people don't want to pay you know car tabs to fund transit. Um, and so I, I think the state tax that that I've heard being considered is that statewide motor vehicle excise tax that, that we no longer have in place, but that some policymakers would really like to put back in place on, on car tabs. It's hugely unpopular um, for a reason. And the second point that I would make, and if you know if, if you have the chart in front of you, state transit is not underfunded. I know that transit advocates like to say, well, you know, transit only gets 4% of state transportation funding, but they get significant funds from local and sales taxes, 140% increase over the last 10 years, in fact, in local and sales taxes. Obviously, sound transit is a, a big part of that increase. Um, but they've also received substantial cash infusions from the federal government, despite plummeting ridership, you know, not, not just in 2020. <laughs> People look at this and they think I'm being unfair because, because ridership obviously suffered in, in 2020 due to COVID. But if you look at the data, ridership started to really level out in 2009. And at the same time, the, the, the increase in funding in local and sales taxes and federal funds um, continued to increase at a very, very steep um, slope, <laughs> if you look at the, if you look at the chart. And so, um, I'm not sure, is the chart showing up? I, I, 
I'm no. It says I'm sharing my screen, but I don't I don't see it right right now right, right there. So what I'll do is, in the uh, chat section, for those of you who want to see the the chart uh, and visualize what Maria is talking about here, I am going to put the uh, direct link into the chat right now. Uh, for everybody. So you just click that chat and you'll see the chart that she's uh, talking about. It's to her most recent uh, publication. Here, how Sorry about, about this? this? Sorry about that interruption there. That's on page page five. So, can you see that chart? Yeah, I can. It's a little too big for, for my screen. There we go. How about now? Yep, 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 got it. There you go. So you can see what I'm talking about when I say it all started in 2009. So you're seeing kind of this slight dip and then a slight increase, but overall kind of a plateau. Meanwhile, you can see the slope of um, transit funding increase and crossover, <laughs> um, despite no corresponding ridership increase. And this is data that you know anybody can find in the State Department of Transportation Summary of Public Transportation. Um, and then you can also you know, look up national transit database numbers, which also come from the Department of Transportation. And so this is why I say um, that that little green sliver there is, is state funding. Yeah, it's, it's a small portion of all the funding that they receive, but again, consider it in the context of all the funding that the transit agencies receive. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that shows there's a, there's a big disconnect between the, the public um, uh, the public, um, let's see, perception that's being pervaded, which is transit systems are chronically underfunded. You know, we're really struggling out here. Versus, a right the and and our ridership's growing and all this kind of thing. Versus the reality of the data, and it's not like this is you know your data. You're making it up. This is uh, data you're collecting from the sources that collect that data. I mean, well, you know, and also no getting around it. I mean, to put it in additional perspective, in, in 2009, transit agencies collected about $3 billion in, in sales and just sales and local taxes, right, which is that 140% increase since 2010, which compare that to state transportation, I mean, transportation funding for the entire state. And in the 2021-23 biennium, the state will collect about $3.3 billion per year, um, which is like slightly, slightly higher. <laughs> it's 3.3 billion compared to 3 billion, but this is money. This is state transportation funding that is paid by drivers who pay for roads and subsidize other transportation modes. And so I, the amount of money that, that transit funding, transit agencies are getting rather is, is substantial. And if the road usage charge is implemented, I think it absolutely it's 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 very simple to me that that money needs to support Washington's road and you know roads and, and bridges, which we all know are in dire need of maintenance and safety improvements that that we all benefit from, not just drivers, but transit and freight and emergency responders as well. There, there was another um, body of questions that were in the Washington Policy Center poll. That uh, that was conducted in December. Um, the poll that we had commissioned again. It was 500 uh, voters. It has a uh, accuracy of um, uh, margin of error of, of plus or minus four um, percent. And but but there was a series of questions that were kind of dealing with priorities, with the basic you know getting down to the roots of what should our transportation system be doing. And it started with um, a question about how people perceive the state, uh, the, uh, the job the state has done in relieving congestion, you know, and there was, you know, what I think about 30%, um, 38% said that, you know, they'd, they'd done a, a decent job relieving traffic congestion. That number seemed high to me, but I thought with COVID being two years, I noted dramatic traffic changes with COVID, you know, for my own commutes and stuff. So I wasn't sure how that fared, but a solid 57% were saying not good. And then you, you did these follow-up questions about you know, where, where the public places their priorities. Where do they want to see money and effort being spent um, when it comes to transportation policy? Now, rather than just tell people what it is, I, I'd like you to tell uh, us about you know, your interpretation of what the results were and what your inter interpretation of the results were when it comes to how people um, responded to where they placed the priority of our, on our transportation policy. 
Sure. I mean, <laughs> people prioritize maintenance and preservation and improvement of roads above all else, first and second, simple. Not surprising. Um, people want the, the freedom to, to choose how they travel. People want freedom of mobility. The great majority of our state obviously travels by automobile, and they want to be able to do that reliably, safely. Um, and it's unfortunate that the State Department of Transportation, you know, <laughs> well, the secretary himself has said congestion is a problem that just can't be solved. And so he's focusing all of his energies on, not on, on reducing traffic congestion, but on managing traffic congestion and, and travel behavior, which you have the poll results, Dave. That's exactly the opposite of what people want. Exactly. And that's what struck me because I, and I, I remember in my radio days, I would interview you uh, fairly frequently on transportation issues. And, and I talked with others about it. And it was the same kind of thing where I we could not imagine that that was not, you know, while the Department of Transportation is saying one thing, the people that commute and get to work, they're constantly frustrated. And I thought, how is it? How can there be this disconnect? And what this poll shows is there, you know, that there is a sharp disconnect. It's not uh, the imagination of those frustrated by bad commutes and horrible traffic and 405 and Seattle being shaped like an hourglass for the vital arterial of the, of, of the state. People are frustrated with how traffic is in, in the state and they wanna see it uh, fixed. Um, the, the trouble is getting policymakers to think about what the public wants and a little less about what they want the public to think. Um, well, that's <laughs> a big challenge. Well, and that's that's a big challenge in Washington state where transportation is less about transportation and more about ideology. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we get from a secretary who used to be the vice president of Smart Growth America. Um, you know, he serves at the pleasure of the governor who, you know, has his priorities that I think are, are really disconnected from, you know, what, what we see in these poll results and in, in other data. You know, just as another good example of this, Secretary Millar recently put out a report on DOT's efforts to reduce vehicle miles traveled, which is you know, reducing how much you drive in a car. And the language in that report really stood out to me. He talks about improving proximity by locating people and the activities they need as if you know, people are, are, are cattle to be herded <laughs> into, into you know, the kind of life um, you know, or he calls them transportation efficient communities, um, as if that's a possibility. What he's talking about are, of course, urban urban villages, which are, you know, <laughs> not practical and not supported by, by data. Um, you know, he also expresses this, he says, potential highway expansion as opposed to other transportation investments generally increases vehicle miles of travel by making access to land farther away more attractive than it previously was. And he says that as if it's a bad thing. <laughs> Which yeah. I, I mean, I think I, giving people access to land farther away, I don't see it as a bad thing because giving people access, you know, to, 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 to travel a farther distance in a shorter period of time means they're able to access more and better jobs with better paying salaries. It makes people more competitive. It allows them the opportunity to be lifted out of poverty and to have an opportunity at a more affluent life. That's what it did for my family. And, and here, Secretary Millar considers that kind of access to distance a negative. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me of the, the, the study that you released. You had commissioned by Wendell Cox and you had a joint um, press uh, availability on that. And one of the, the key disclosures or the key findings of that report was, was hey, people, you know, people need mobility in order to find the best jobs. They cannot rely on, you know, the tran transit's not going to do it, public transit. These uh, urban villages, they, they, they sound wonderful on paper, but it's not where jobs are, it's, and, and it uh, freezes people out of mobility. So it would basically leave people, you know, that there's a, an ideology that looks at people and sees them as static creatures, that you're always going to be where you are right now, in the situation you're in right now, living where you are right now, in the same economic bracket where you are right now. And that's just not how human beings actually live. So. No, I mean, employers don't make decisions about who they hire based on where, where folks reside, vice versa. You know, specialized workers don't make decisions about where they're going to work. Um, 
based on on that proximity most people are willing to travel for a really great job and furthermore you know wendell shows that our region is increasingly more dispersed in 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 employment you know 85 percent of our employment in the puget sound is outside of the city of seattle seattle obviously dominates in in transit share but that transit share drops to like three percent for the rest of puget <laughs> sound where most people really do depend on a car to get around here and so you know, transit doesn't have a substantial, it has no chance of reducing vehicle miles traveled, um, you know, through through transit expansion. This is how people are, are choosing to, to move about. And I think the Department of Transportation needs to spend public money in a way that, you know, the public demands. And, and by the way, we didn't even address the, the second priority that people had. They were asked to rank, you know, for a second. Um, the second most cited uh, priority was it wasn't transit, it was building more roads, adding lanes to traffic choke points and expanding highways. I mean, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that, that our own um, state policy has been trying to discourage and squash you know, for decades, you know, this, this, this idea that, that we should be doing these things. And then uh, the third place was funding local and transit agencies at 23%. So, you know, you can see that there's a, the, the state is pushing very hard on policies that are not the priority of the of the vast majority of people. Well, and what's ironic about it all is is the Department of Transportation likes to talk about how you know we just can't reduce congestion by improving capacity, um, and yet when it serves them, they do just that. Right, a few years ago when we were still you know when we had the four hundred five toll experiment underway as it was still a pilot project it was wrapping up the toll lanes were failing um they were not moving you know 45 miles per hour 90 percent of the time as required and so the department of transportation opened up the shoulder lane on 405 um, to traffic to alleviate some of the traffic in the express toll lanes and, and get give people more general purpose capacity <laughs> you know in an admission that adding that capacity reduce traffic congestion and so i you know i think contrary to what the agency and other transit advocates will say i think reducing traffic congestion through strategic capacity improvements is not off the table and there is you know there are absolutely you know anecdotes but also data that show capacity improvements work and are helpful and are needed all right, uh, before we run out of time for questions, I'd like to bring um, all of our panelists back. Uh, Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director, and Pamela Lewison, our Initiative on Agriculture Director. Um, and Maria, you stay with us as well. Um, and if you have questions, ask them now in the Q&A box there in your Zoom uh, tools. It's probably at the bottom of your screen or on the side of your screen. If you don't see it, um, make it a full screen view and it'll, it'll appear on your screen um, easy enough. First question, um, gas tax is the easiest and least costly method of collecting monies for the road, but it no longer works because a large number of drivers are now going to tribal gas stations along I-5. And if they put 30 gallons, they save $30 per tank fill up. Therefore, Drivers are going to tribal casinos and losing these dollars as tribal casinos pay no taxes. In Ferndale, we have a tribal casino on off the reservation and they always have 14 cars filling and non-tribal uh, have an average of one car. What is your thought on, um, on these differences in gas prices and how that impacts state funding, generally speaking? I would have to think about that. I mean, I know our state has an agreement in place. I think it's a 75-25 agreement with, with tribes. So they actually get refunds um, in, in, they get gas tax refunds. Um, I don't know, Dave, I don't have a good answer to that right now. I don't think that's the main issue, but it's certainly an issue. And I do need to look into it further before I feel confident. Yeah, I've, any other kind of I remember when I was- I remember when I was in the legislature, I saw reports on that being, uh, you know, a larger issue in some areas than than others, right. um, but but not uh, not as significant statewide. Uh, next question: Would the road usage charge be able to be used to fund Washington State ferries, which seemingly needs much more funding? Well, Washington State ferries and State Patrol are both can be funded legally with 18th, 18th Amendment protected funds. So the answer is yes. 
Um, next is a land use question. Let's see. Um, let me find where it is here. Well, the question was about zoning and whether or not we should eliminate zoning in order to um, allow for affordable housing. Mark, um, this is uh, at least a little bit in your wheelhouse. Do you want to tackle that question? Um, I, I, you can't eliminate all zoning, otherwise you're going to end up with, you know, a, a, an aluminum smelter next to a childcare, which is <laughs> not going to work. Yeah. Um, so you definitely, uh, definitely uh, want to be careful there. But, you know, I'm, my opinion is uh, on a lot of the zoning regulations, if, if you're not doing something that's hurting your neighbor, then you should be able to build where you want. And what we've got right now is is sort of the worst of both worlds, where we've got the Growth Management Act that is restricting where you can build. So you, the, and the original intent was to avoid sort of the L.A. sprawl, which we don't want to see. Um, and, and what has created these are these sort of higher density backfills. I mean, my own city has population target goals. I don't know if many people know this, but in order to continue issuing its SEPA permits, it has to hit certain population goals by certain dates. So you end up with this massive density, which then creates transportation problems because the roads aren't upgraded to support this. And, and the, the, the miss idea behind the GMA or the, the flawed idea behind it is that people were going to work in these communities. And, and that may be the case in some cases, but majority of people end up living in these communities and trying to commute to these other places, which sort of ties in with what Maria's talking about. And you end up being a long way out. Do I think we should change the zoning? Yeah, we definitely need to update the GMA. We definitely need to loosen our zoning up, um, but we've got to do it intelligently. And the other thing is, I think we need to make sure that we've got local control. What works in one community might not work in another community. And so opening things up and then saying, okay, now the local level, maybe it's municipal, including your homeowners associations and for folks that have signed up for that, allow them to decide what's appropriate for their community. And that you'll, you'll get higher um, growth that way as far as housing, because what's happening right now is we're seeing a huge restriction in the amount of properties being built. And that needs to change. We need to build more houses. We just got to do it in a smart way. Yeah, it's a strange thing. There seems to be a, among some city officials a war on single family homes, as though that's the great enemy. Even in, you know, there was a politician who stopped by my house and was saying that that, uh, that they needed condos everywhere. And, and there's so there's so many vast tracts of Tacoma that um, are you know, would be would probably welcome development with con with uh, condos and apartment buildings and other things that wouldn't necess necessitate the destruction of of older attractive single family homes. Right, just, and, just like just like the transit rider wants to get into a car when they can afford it, you know the condo or the apartment renter wants to get into their own home when they can afford it. It's the same thing. We need right. condos, we need apartments, and for some people that's a great lifestyle and they enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've thought about it, but at the end of the day, there's nothing better than raising a family in a single family home. Next question, has there been a study of the of the regressivity of a, a pay per mile tax in actual practice? For example, in many uh, densely populated areas, workers at the lower end of the income scale tend to live further from their place of employment. In addition to the impact on rural drivers, the impacts on low income households could be severe. Uh, Maria, are you familiar with any of that? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, and I see that it's from Brian. There was actually a, um, there was a VMT study, a VM, like a um, mileage tax study basically several years ago. I think it was like 2012 or 2013 by DOT looking at the impact of VMT type taxes on rural residents. Um, and so Brian, I can, I can email that to you, but I, I will say when it comes to a road usage charge, it, it really, if you are a rural resident and you're already paying um, a lot in gas tax, you're driving a lot, you're gonna still pay a lot under a road usage charge. Um, that That's not going to, I guess, especially if your vehicle gets less than 20 miles per gallon, you're still, you're going to pay a very high gas tax as you do anyway. The, the road usage charge isn't based on your, um, isn't adjusted per mile. It's, it's adjusted based on your fuel efficiency, the, your vehicle fuel efficiency. However, I will add that a road usage charge, one of the, one of the 
things that concern me the most is that it is, you know, as the State Transportation Commission has called it, more three-dimensional <laughs> than a gas tax. And so it can be layered with, with other features that, that give government more information um, and allow them to, for example, layer the road usage charge with congestion pricing. And if that happens, then you absolutely will see that, that impact on people who don't have the option of telework or living in Seattle and being able to you know, walk a couple blocks or, or take a bus to work. Um, those folks have to get in their car and drive to work at the same time every day as everybody else during peak commute hours. And um, if, if those peak hours are upcharged, then absolutely that will have a regressive and negative impact. Um, and that is one of my concerns since we know that the Department of Transportation Secretary, Seattle DOT, both support congestion pricing. The State Transportation Commission does not. If we were to implement congestion pricing in the road usage charge, that would require mandatory GPS trackers in your cars. And I don't think that's constitutional. Uh, Maria, next question. Why is there such a problem with giving transit some of the road usage charge? Make the case. Darn it. I thought I made the case. I, I thought so, I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we need to resummarize. It's uh, you're replacing, let, let me see if I can do it for you. You're replacing the gas tax. The gas tax is protected specifically for highway purposes. And that enables us to maintain our current highways and, road, and, and roads. Um, and without that, if that money is diverted, then all of the, that gets um, uh, is put in jeopardy and drivers are not getting what they're paying for. If people who benefit from transit or need transit, um, you know, would like additional funding for transit, then they can, then I guess, you know, policymakers can run legislation that's really specific to a city or a locality to see if voters want to, you know, tax themselves more <laughs> for those transit improvements. But I don't, I don't see um, the diversion of dollars from drivers. Many of them, the ones who pay the most or the ones who drive the farthest, as we just talked about, it doesn't seem fair to me to keep um, taking more money for, from drivers to, to support systems that they neither use nor, nor benefit from. Next question, Mark, is there any chance bounty-based laws are unconstitutional? Uh, I actually think there is a fairly good chance, um, and I touched on it just a little bit, where uh, where I talked about um, if you were to bring a, a suit against another employer um, where you have no standing, and I think that's where uh, we will run into the legal challenge. And that doesn't stop the legislature passing it. They pass lots of un unconstitutional laws all day long, um, but it's until our third branch of government kicks in here and in the judicial, somebody then sues that these laws are overturned as we're seeing with many things at the federal level right now. So yeah, I think there's a, I, I personally believe it's a it's a uh, constitutional problem, but um, that if it was to pass would have to be proven out in court. And I would add on the amount of money for roads, I don't think there is enough because I keep hitting potholes and bending my tires. So somebody needs to fix that problem for sure. You've been driving near my house lately, Mark, have you? Yeah, that um, would be Tacoma, right? Yeah. Well, anywhere along I-5 actually is, is fine, but Tacoma also. Uh, last question, because we're just out of time. Um, why hasn't anyone mentioned that, that the land use new buffers along water bodies, even those that are drainage ditches that have never seen a salmon, would have serious adverse effects on the building of affordable housing. We hear about such immense takings affecting agriculture, which is a great concern, but we are aware that even current unwarranted buffers are adversely affecting the amount of land available for building needed housing. On one property that's only a few acres, if this goes through, it would keep three to five homes from being constructed. So the primary reason we have talked about this being an ag bill is because uh, places where there's infrastructure already in place, if there's a roadway, a park, uh, or a house, or anything else that constitutes um, infrastructure, uh, the bill doesn't apply. So uh, most of the discussion is centered around agricultural and rural communities because it appears to be targeted toward them. Um, I, I agree that there's some concern around housing developments and that sort of thing. Um, but when you look at the, the meat and potatoes from the bill, what we're really talking about here is targeting ag land. Uh, and you know, I would 
argue that uh, those houses may find their way onto farms because this bill is telling farmers that they don't they aren't wanted in Washington, and this is their opportunity um, to call up some developers and say, hey, what's the best price you're going to give me because it's going to be better than the thousand bucks an acre that this piece of legislation is going to give me further down the road. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, uh, I've heard that from a number of people asking that question. Where do these folks think, what, what do these folks think is going to happen if they drive farmers out of business to that land? Do they think it's just going to sit there as pristine landscape, you know, or um, are they, you know, paving the way for, uh, pun intended, paving the way for developers, you know, to come and, and you know, and, and take over where the farms used to be? So it's a, it's a great point, Pam. I appreciate it. We're completely out of time. I want to thank Pam Lewison, our uh, Initiative on Agriculture Director, Maria Frost, the Cole Center for Transportation Director, and Mark Harmsworth, Washington Policy Center's Small Business uh, Director, for being part of the show today. If you appreciate the information here, I want to remind you, every day our research directors um, are posting new information and breaking information about the legislature and new policy on our blog at WashingtonPolicy.org. And we do it because people like you uh, contribute to Washington Policy Center. We hope you'll become a member. We hope you'll share our information, even events like this, because uh, we have them every week with friends and, and urge them to attend. They're free. Um, our, our research and information is available free online. We hope you'll use it and share it on social media. Um, subscribe to our, uh, our email newsletter on Fridays so that you can share that as well and be up to date uh, fast. Um, on what's happening in your state and be active in this state as well. So go to WashingtonPolicy.org, become a member if you're not, and, uh, and keep our work continuing. On behalf of Washington Policy Center, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, and don't forget Friday on Facebook, we have uh, Policy Perspectives, a new show just on our Facebook channel. Go to um, wash. You don't have to be a. You don't have to register or anything. Just at Friday at, at noon, go to our Facebook channel for policy perspectives with our vice president for research and interim president Paul Guppy, and our Eastern Washington director Chris Cargill.